the first reason of delay was that um, SpaceX <clears throat> failed to provide an updated sonic boom analysis, so there was a 30-day delay due to that. Uh, and then the latest delay was their failure to comply with Texas law, which is a prerequisite to getting a, a, a launch permit. The path to Flight 5 has been particularly challenging, especially with the FAA's involvement. One major concern revolves around the unprecedented task of catching the Super Heavy booster using the Mechazilla arm at Starbase. Given these obstacles, along with SpaceX's long-term vision, should the company consider alternative options, such as moving the landing operations offshore? This could potentially eliminate FAA intervention altogether. But how would such a change impact Starship's operations, and how soon could this solution be implemented? Join us on today's episode of Great SpaceX as we explore these questions. Well, with the latest updates from the FAA, it's clear that SpaceX's highly anticipated Flight 5 will face further delays pushing the timeline to at least late November. This delay has sparked significant criticism of the FAA in recent weeks, as many view the agency's actions as overly restrictive. The FAA has responded by giving what some consider absurd arguments with one of their primary justifications being that SpaceX frequently changes its mission plans. According to the FAA, each flight of Starship has unique mission parameters, which means previous licenses are no longer in effect, thus requiring SpaceX to modify and seek new licenses for approval. This ongoing regulatory friction highlights a deeper issue, the FAA's apparent discomfort with SpaceX's iterative and fast-paced approach to innovation. Starship, much like any rocket in its developmental phase, needs to constantly change to achieve new strides. This process of iteration is essential not only for Starship but for any cutting-edge aerospace technology. By repeatedly insisting that SpaceX stick to rigid licensing protocols, the FAA appears to be stifling progress. For instance, the agency has suggested that SpaceX can proceed if the company simply keeps the same missions as in Flight 4, which would involve landing the stages in the ocean. However, there are several drawbacks to this approach. This method will take some time to move to the mainland, and introduces risks during transport. It also runs counter to SpaceX's goal of reusing Starship and Super Heavy daily, as Elon Musk has envisioned. Additionally, given the sheer size and power of Starship, the drone ships required would need to be larger and more durable than those currently used for Falcon, to withstand both the immense thrust of the rocket and the unpredictable conditions of the ocean. Finally, landing on a drone ship would require SpaceX to redesign Starship and Super Heavy to add landing legs, a feature that had previously been removed as part of the plan to catch the booster with the Mechazilla arm. Faced with these barriers, it raises the question, should SpaceX explore alternative solutions to overcome regulatory bottlenecks? One potential solution is to move the landing operation to the sea. By shifting operations offshore, SpaceX could bypass many of the FAA's regulatory constraints as well as avoid scrutiny from environmental agencies. Operating at sea also minimizes risks to people and surrounding systems, compared to land-based operations, creating a safer testing environment. In the event of an emergency or anomaly, SpaceX could quickly change direction to land stages in the sea, mitigating potential harm to populated areas. But transitioning to sea-based operations would require rethinking the landing approach for both Starship and the Super Heavy booster. Several methods could be considered, each with its own set of challenges and advantages. The first option is landing on a drone ship, a technique that SpaceX has applied for many years with the Falcon rocket. Though it faced challenges in the early stages, it ultimately proved to be extremely effective. Given SpaceX's extensive experience with drone ships, applying this method to Starship could be done with relative efficiency. Drone ships offer the flexibility to pick up rockets anywhere, ensuring that SpaceX can avoid disrupting other industries or ecosystems. Furthermore, landing on a drone ship reduces the stringent precision requirements, precision requirements compared to the more ambitious Mechazilla arm catch at Starbase. After recovering the rocket, the drone ship would then transport it back to shore for refurbishment, 
preparing it for the next launch. But like I said before, this method requires a lot more time and includes more risks. Instead of launching daily, the Starship's cadence would be severely cut back in order to transport it from the sea to the mainland. The drone ships themselves would also need to be robust enough for the sheer weight and force of the Starship. Not only that, but like I mentioned before, we'd need to have a Starship that's capable of landing without the use of the Mechazilla arm at Starbase, meaning the addition of landing legs. A second option could involve constructing a fixed launch platform at sea. This approach would allow SpaceX to build a stable structure where a launch tower could be installed, enabling land-like operations, including catching the booster with the chopstick arms. A fixed platform provides much greater stability compared to a mobile drone ship, and it would help SpaceX achieve the expected launch speed necessary to meet their goals. However, this method is not without its limitations. It lacks flexibility and would require the construction of additional infrastructure, such as tank farms for fuel storage and a reliable transportation system to move materials and personnel. These subsystems are necessary to maintain consistent operations but add logistical complexity. Moreover, this method would still require precision and a smooth combination between the rocket and the launch tower, much like land-based operations. Now, a hybrid solution would be to combine a launch tower with a mobile drone ship, offering both mobility and the stability of a fixed platform. This approach reduces the need for land-based infrastructure and helps SpaceX avoid regulatory issues. However, the main challenge is whether the tower can withstand the forces of a Starship launch. Sea-based operations have several advantages, such as reducing the rocket's travel distance back to the launch site, which optimizes fuel use and increases payload capacity. Offshore launches are already part of SpaceX's future plans, as outlined in the FAA's Environmental Impact Statement, with provisions for drone ship landings in the Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico, and other oceans. In 2021, SpaceX purchased two oil rigs with plans to convert them into launch and landing pads for Starship, but later sold them. However, as recently as early 2023, Gwyn Shotwell reaffirmed the company's intentions, stating, we're going to have a lot of launch pads. I think we're going to have a lot of platforms at sea. We need to see how this vehicle is going to perform. Although this plan was made some time ago, SpaceX could easily restart the initiative if necessary. A recent event supports this potential move. SpaceX recovered parts of Booster 11, the Super Heavy from Flight 4, which had been underwater for over three months following the flight's issues. Naturally, the components were not intact. While this recovery differed from the full retrieval we had hoped for, it nonetheless represents an important step toward future sea-based rocket recovery operations. These recovered parts will be analyzed to assess the effects of both the flight and ocean exposure on the prototype, offering SpaceX valuable data to improve systems before expanding Starship's operations at sea. What are your thoughts on SpaceX moving its landing operations to the sea? Which recovery method do you prefer? Share your opinion in the comments, and don't forget to like, share the video, and subscribe to our channel to keep up with SpaceX's development journey. While there are several potential solutions, we likely won't see these methods implemented immediately. For the next few flights, SpaceX's priority remains the landing of Starship using the Mechazilla arm at Starbase. In recent months, SpaceX has continuously upgraded and tested the systems at the launch pad, particularly the chopstick mechanism. Additionally, the construction of Launch Tower B at the site has just been completed, with other subsystems expected to follow in the coming months, indicating that the Starbase system will continue to play a major role. As for Flight 5, the hardware has already been rolled out to the launch site, and SpaceX recently lifted Super Heavy to an unprecedented height using the chopstick arms. These stages were then fully stacked and tested, demonstrating SpaceX's determination to catch Super Heavy on this flight. After Flight 5, it's possible that Flight 6 and several other upcoming flights will continue to use this method, with the ultimate goal of fully landing and reusing Starship.
Despite the risks and regulatory challenges from government agencies, landing with the Megazilla arm remains the most efficient method for SpaceX to achieve rapid reusability. This explains why SpaceX continues to criticize the FAA's process, as it not only impacts the upcoming flights, but also the long-term development of Starship. It seems that SpaceX will need to proceed step by step, achieving one milestone at a time rather than making any sudden shifts. For now, the SpaceX team has plenty of work ahead as they prepare for the next mission and work to overcome the regulatory barriers imposed by the FAA, ensuring the next phases can progress more swiftly. We can certainly look forward to the unprecedented and impressive moments that Starship and the Chopstick system will deliver in the near future. That said, the potential for sea-based landings remains strong. If these methods offer benefits to Starship and the aerospace industry, there's no doubt SpaceX will explore and implement them. But the Mechazilla arm landing on land and various sea landing methods present exciting opportunities. Rather than viewing them as competing approaches, it's worth considering how they can complement each other, creating a diverse range of landing options for Starship. This diversity will help SpaceX maintain the rapid launch landing relaunch cycle they aim for. The future of space travel looks bright for Starship, assuming there are no obstacles to slow its progress. Let's see how this giant rocket will take off and return in the exciting times ahead. After spending more than three months in the depths of the ocean, SpaceX has finally provided an update on the status of Booster B-11. This resilient booster has certainly earned the title of a warrior. But what exactly happened to B-11? We'll dive into these details shortly. More than three months have passed since Flight 4, and in addition to waiting for Flight 5, many are eagerly anticipating updates on the recovery of the hardware from the previous flight. This interest is understandable, as Flight 4 marked the first time both Starship stages successfully landed, a significant milestone compared to previous missions. Recently, Elon Musk shared images of Booster B-11 accompanied by the message, Starship Super Heavy Booster Flight 4. The images show that the booster sustained significant damage and is no longer intact, likely due to the impact of the flight itself as well as months spent in the ocean. Nevertheless, it's a remarkable image. The image specifically captures the aft section of B-11, along with a few smaller pieces from the upper parts. Much of the internal structure is missing, leaving only the outer shell and the engine ring system visible. Of the original engines, only 14 from the outer ring remain and most have been deformed into various shapes. Inside, the exposed wiring and fuel systems show extensive damage as well. This damage aligns with the earlier landing images of B-11 where one side of the booster appeared to have been scorched. It's possible that some of the engines not visible in the current image were already damaged upon landing and the subsequent time in the sea likely caused parts to break away. The upper portion of the booster is also completely missing from the photo, though those parts may have been recovered earlier. In fact, earlier reports indicated that parts of B-11 had been retrieved. In a previous update, we mentioned the activities of the ship M-V Haas Richwind, which was tasked with picking up divers and operated in early September. This suggests that other parts of B-11 might have already been brought back. We will continue to provide updates on the status of the salvaged components, including the upper section of the booster and the S-29. Many are particularly interested in seeing the condition of S-29, especially after its forward flap burned during flight. In response to the tweet about B-11, Elon Musk commented, Fixer Upper, hinting at SpaceX's ongoing efforts to recover and analyze Flight 4's hardware. This recovery effort is crucial for SpaceX. As I've mentioned, this is the first time Starship's stages have landed successfully. SpaceX must capitalize on this opportunity by recovering parts for further analysis and future development. One of the key goals will be to examine the damage from the flight to understand what went wrong. While the ocean's effects may distort some of the findings, the data collected will still be invaluable. For instance, SpaceX can study why the engines became so deformed, which could lead to future design improvements. Additionally, as part of SpaceX's history of development, I hope they preserve these parts for display in a museum. They would serve as symbols of the early stages of Starship's evolution, particularly the advancements in reusability. It would also be fantastic if the insights gained from B-11 could be applied to Flight 5. 
Unfortunately, we'll have to wait another two months until late November for the next launch. While the delay is disappointing, it offers SpaceX more time to refine the Flight 5 hardware based on the data from Flight 4, potentially increasing the success rate of the upcoming mission. Yep, that will be when Super Heavy will return to Starbase and land on the Mechazilla arm. This mission is unprecedented and certainly extremely difficult, but if they can collect data from the previous flight, that will be the basis for them to prepare well for the feat. In addition, the B-11 recovery may also have a significant impact on the FAA. SpaceX has been constantly making arguments aimed at the FAA's process. They recently completed the full stack of Flight 5 hardware, and the recovery of the B-11 parts is also an important achievement for them to promote the progress of Starship. Of course, in the future, we won't want the hardware to return on a recovery ship. Instead, it needs to come back in other impressive ways, like landing on the Mechazilla arm, standing proudly on a drone ship, or an ocean platform. But after all, the return of B-11 is a major milestone for SpaceX's Starship this year. So please, welcome B-11 back home by responding with 11 in the comment section down below. Then, like, share, and subscribe to our channel to continue following SpaceX's development journey. However, for SpaceX to fully realize its vision, there remains a long road ahead, particularly as they continue to face delays imposed by various organizations through regulations and lawsuits. Recently, a well-known company, Cards Against Humanity, yes, the party game with a humorous name, filed a lawsuit against SpaceX, accusing them of trespassing and damaging land the company purchased in 2017. They are seeking $15 million in compensation for the alleged harm. This land, located in Cameron County, was initially bought as part of an effort to oppose Donald Trump's plan to build a border wall between the U.S. and Mexico during his presidency. The campaign dubbed Cards Against Humanity Saves America attracted 150,000 supporters and raised $15 million to buy the land. Cards Against Humanity claims that SpaceX not only damaged the land, but also harmed the company's relationship with its supporters. They also allege that SpaceX offered less than half of the $15 million in compensation, which was rejected. It seems absurd that even a game company is now involved in hindering SpaceX's progress. This raises the question, is there an underlying force influencing both government agencies and private entities to slow down SpaceX at every turn, whether through investigations, flight delays, or legal actions? Meanwhile, it's noticeable that SpaceX's competitors appear unaffected. What could this suggest? Now, more than ever, these barriers need to be dismantled. Internal competition must be addressed so the focus can shift to national development. China is rising rapidly in the space race, and currently only SpaceX has the potential to help the U.S. stay ahead. It'd be disappointing if internal conflicts gave China the opportunity to surpass us. If you agree, type yes in the comment section. Speaking of China, let's shift our focus for an update on the recent failure of China's copycat rocket. Specifically, Deep Blue Aerospace, a Chinese company, reported that its first reusable rocket, Nebula 1, which runs on kerosene fuel, failed during its high-altitude vertical recovery test. The failure occurred in the final stage of the test, which lasted 179 seconds. The test prototype stood 21 meters tall and had a diameter of 3.35 meters. China's Asia spaceflight posted on X while most parts of the test went as planned, the rocket landed a little too hard and collapsed. They further explained, two years ago, Nebula 1M seemed to suffer a hard landing, but Deep Blue never released the full footage or commented on it. It's good that they're being transparent this time. Nebula 1 slowed down to a hover, but the engine shut off at an unsafe height. Specifically, two of the rocket's engines failed before landing. As the rocket neared the landing zone, it fell abruptly, crashing violently and damaging the aft section and landing legs. However, videos and images of the entire preparation, launch, and landing process were released, showing that most of the flight, including the deceleration, appeared to go smoothly. Post-test images revealed that while the upper portion of the rocket seemed largely intact, the lower part was severely burned and damaged. 
Previously, investors and developers expressed confidence that by utilizing kerosene, methane, and liquid oxygen, they could reduce costs and create cleaner, more efficient rockets. The ultimate goal, to compete with SpaceX. Deep Blue Aerospace, along with many other Chinese startups, has adopted a copycat strategy in an attempt to push forward the commercial space industry and compete with the US, which is home to several strong private space companies. But as we've seen, developing rockets is no easy task. The recent failure of this test highlights that copying SpaceX's technology doesn't guarantee success. At best, it offers temporary gains. This underscores why SpaceX remains the dominant force in the rocket industry. Achieving their current level of expertise, particularly in landing and reusing rockets, required overcoming numerous challenges. But it's those very challenges that have made SpaceX stronger continually driving innovation. The failure of Deep Blue Aerospace also reinforces that, at present, only SpaceX is well positioned to outpace China in the space race. Technological obstacles, while significant, are less of a concern for SpaceX's engineers than the regulatory hurdles they currently face. While China may have failed in this instance, given time, they could certainly make progress. The US must act quickly, to implement reforms that support SpaceX, as these reforms are key to ensuring the country maintains its lead in this increasingly competitive space race. Well, folks, that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in, and as always, this has been Kevin from Great SpaceX. Until next time, keep looking up.